One thing that I see fairly often and occasionally am guilty of doing myself is using count distinct and distinct interchangeably to see the unique values in a column of data. The question is though, are they really interchangeable? So let's start with this table of data. You'll notice that there are some duplicate values in column one. This is gonna be really important for seeing how the following queries work. So let's say we have count distinct from column one from our test table, and you'll notice the query returns a count of two unique values. That's great. If we wanna see what those values are, maybe we just get rid of the count and say select distinct from column one, and that should return all the unique values in that column. The interesting thing here is though, instead of getting just two rows of data back, we actually get three. We have A, B, and a null. And while this discrepancy between two versus three values is clearly explained in the SQL Server documentation, there may be times where you would want this logic to match up. Let's take a look at how we can accomplish that. If you wanna get the distinct values without the nulls, it's pretty easy, right? We could just say where column one is not null in a where clause and that'll basically just return the values of A and B with no nulls. Trying to go in the opposite direction by getting a distinct count of all the different values, which includes our null values, is a little bit more challenging and we have a couple different options. Our first option, which is probably the worst, is to do a count distinct with an is null. And we can do this with a case when as if we wanted to as well. The idea here is that we're gonna replace a null value with some unique value that we know isn't gonna exist in our data, which will then allow the count distinct to count it. The reason this is a bad way to do it is because that is null is gonna force SQL Server to perform that check on every single row in our table or our index, uh, which will just cause poor performance. Our second option is to just do a count distinct, which will give us the count without the null values, and then add in a count distinct when null values exist. So that value will always either be a zero or a one, depending on if nulls exist. Taking the sum of those two values will then give us the correct count, which includes nulls for our column. But we are gonna have to do these aggregations twice and still do a case statement based on those nulls. The third option is to use a derived table to do a select distinct, which will include our null values, and then do a count star on top of that derived table. See, when we say count with a column name, SQL Server will give us the unique values and not include nulls. And so if you have logic where you do want to include nulls in your counts or you don't want to include those nulls, the best thing to do is just test your queries, check the data and make sure that those nulls are either being counted or ignored based on what you want. So thanks for joining me again this week. If you're not already subscribed, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss a weekly episode and I'll see you next time. Thanks.